Super Bowl ads. One final point, Gary. Buy them. <laughs> you got your perspective. I just want to be happy. Don't you want to be happy? What's up, guys? This is a, a fun uh, conversation we had the day after the Super Bowl in New York City uh, with some great people from Pepsi and Notch and uh, NBCU. Uh, super excited about the conversation. Very macro branding TV stuff that I think is a different look for some of you, but there's some thematics in it that could be unbelievably valuable. So some thoughtful branding and marketing talk. Hope you enjoy it. Despite any controversies, advertisers are flocking to the Super Bowl to get their brand messages across. It's reported that CBS made $382 million at five million per 30 second ad. And it's not surprising because uh, three out of four people say they look forward to the Super Bowl ads. And research shows that uh, memorability for brands in the Super Bowl are 54% higher than regular television norms. So it's really a great place to put your, your ads regardless. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that today. Um, you know, people are talking about them still, they're watching them on YouTube. And so we wanna talk about what is the impact that the Super Bowl has for ads today um, using some of the, the notch research that measured these ads and the positive impact or negative impact that people felt about them. So the first question I'm gonna ask um, is to start, maybe you guys can guess, if we measure 3,000 people in our industry ranked the ads, um, can anyone guess what was the number one ad? Don't be shy, it's okay. Out of those 12 or all the ones that are? Out, of, the, out, out of, of those 11. Out of these. Do you have a guess? So it was Amazon, not everything makes the cut, and next up was the Gillette, we believe the best men can be. Um, as a matter of fact, all the ads measured um, mostly had positive impact um, and, and sentiment, except for um, neutral was Pepsi, more than okay, Bumble, and Bon and Viv, the pitch um, of that. That was actually the only one that was negative. That was negative? Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. That was the only yeah, one that was negative. The last one that we just saw, the mermaids. I Every actually just realized, I, this is like the third or fourth time I've seen it, and I just got the Shark Tank thing. I didn't, I didn't get, I was like, oh! I was so confused. <laughs> Sorry. Um, okay, but why do you think, and maybe Andy, you can start, um, that the Amazon and Gillette rank so highly? Yeah, well, I think just at a high level, this is from a, a personal standpoint as well, as someone who watches a lot of the ads and less of the football. I thought this year was really interesting because uh, it felt like most of the brands played it safe. There was a lot of neutrality, actually, in the sentiment that we captured, even though it was probably skewing towards positive. Um, I think last year we saw a bunch of backlash against some of the advertising that was put out there. Some of the brands were trying to take probably a, a bolder <laughs> statement using cultural um, uh, uh, trends and um, uh, and different borrowing from the past of uh, different really great people in American history um, and therefore sort of got in trouble on social shortly after. So I think this year we saw a lot of the brands uh, playing it relatively safe. Gillette I don't think was actually on the Super Bowl but as you all I'm sure like almost everyone here has heard about the ad before even walking into this room. And I think really what's what's going on there is obviously tapping into a, a massive uh, revolution that has happened over the last year. Um, I've heard very polarizing opinions from different categories of people. I think women have had more uh, positive reactions than men on average. I think it also depends who Gillette was trying to uh, to kind of aim towards. Was it uh, men of a particular type of belief, men who kind of live in urban areas and have already been touched by a lot of the changes that have come with the Me Too movement or was it a very different category of people? So I think a lot of these questions actually pop up for me. I'm kind of the token data nerd on the panel and I think when we talk about the Super Bowl, um, what I've noticed is uh, you know brands don't love hearing about data and measurement. Everyone wants to have a very strong opinion when it comes to whether it works or not. 
And I think the bigger question for me, which I hope we can tap into tonight, is to figure out what brands does it make sense for? What type of campaigns does it make sense for? Is it a brand awareness? Is it a reach goal? Um, and then how do you really kind of follow up that on all the other platforms that, uh, that matter as well, which, you know, all the digital platforms? How do you make sure that you're creating more than just this one moment in time? Um, and I'll give you just a quick example, which I was recently approved to use. Um, I was having a conversation with the CMO of Denny's. They did a Super Bowl ad a few years ago. And they were offering uh, some type of offer. They, they managed actually to bring a ton of people into Denny's as a follow-up to the Super Bowl. So there was like a very significant impact that they saw. And they were able to deliver on the promise that they made in the Super Bowl ad. But then every time the same group of people would go back to Denny's, they you know, would get a you know, neutral to negative experience because they actually hadn't figured out by then how to scale the rest of the company to the traffic and the promise that the Super Bowl ad made. So I thought that was a really interesting um, example of, you know, this is not just a once in a lifetime or once a year type of thing to do. You actually have to be very thoughtful about how you use it and how it then integrates not just with the rest of your marketing, but with the rest of your business. So that, that's an interesting point because as I was reading some insights that uh, journalists were writing about from the Super Bowl advertising, one thing that came out, and Gary, I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk to you about this one, is that many marketers are, are using social platforms to extend the Super Bowl ad, and a lot of advertisers pre-launched the commercials to build up. One example um, that, that I thought was really interesting was that the avocado growers from Mexico, they went to social to, to actually make guacamole like a Super Bowl um, item that you serve, and they sold 58.4 million avocados for the Super Bowl this year, and that was before they even advertised in the Super Bowl. So, I mean, this is a huge change than 10 years ago, and if you could talk a little bit about, I mean, I know you did a lot of work with planters and um, social impact before and after. If you could talk a little bit about how you think it's changed and what marketers can do to use social to really you know, extend the life of their Super Bowl investment. Thanks, thanks for having us. Um, so from my standpoint, it's like, why wouldn't you use tools that are available to you to drive your business? So social to me is a slang term for the current state of where people spend their time on the internet which is all about attention, right? Like what's the purpose of these ads? Like, like awareness or, or attention is, that's the best part about the Super Bowl, right? Like you're gonna get consumption. Like to me it's why it's my favorite piece of advertising in the world, like in the US, excuse me. Like it is going to get consumed, whether on YouTube the week before, whether during the game, whether the next day, this is going to get consumed. So that's exciting. And then to not use social, as a matter of fact, I actually think brands should really consider not showing it on YouTube. Like for five years I was all about showing it on YouTube and now I'm wondering if for next year maybe they shouldn't because some of the surprise elements are being eliminated during the game and I'm just kind of like feeling like is this the moment? Like is this the tipping point where you wanna pull back? But it all leads to the biggest punchline which is these are businesses that are trying to drive business and this is one of the opportunities at their disposal but so is Twitter the week before and so is pre-roll YouTube the day of and so I'm fascinated by people's binary points of view on things. It's obviously a mix of a lot of different things but this is a cultural event. We're having an event, a business event around it. We don't do that for the Grammys or the Oscars or the NBA Finals. So to me, what do I think about it? I think anybody who doesn't have a robust uh, strategy to do creative and media amplification on the platforms that dominate our mobile devices is in outer space in 2019. So you mentioned creative and yet, I mean in this room I'm sure so many people created ads that they're so proud of yet there's a lot of ads in the Super Bowl like I'm not sure if anyone saw the chunky milk by Mint Mobile, um, you know, my family was so horrified and grossed out and just thought that was the worst commercial they ever saw, yet people are talking about Mint Mobile. So does creative really matter, um, you know, for the, super, for the Super Bowl? Creative is the variable of success, the end. So yes, it does. The bigger question becomes, does everybody talking about it mean people are gonna go buy it? 
you know, I think that the industry coming from the outside of growing up in, you know, retail and SMB and, and investing and now coming to it, talking about it or winning these awards or the rankings, you know, to me, somebody within all these companies actually cares about the business, right? And so I think, um, yes, creative is the variable of success. Did it inspire or make you think that you want to consider and then buy these products? So I, I, you know, a lot of people know that I have a big passion for volume of content, quantity, which our industry believes means not quality, which I think is silly. Um, but I've, for the whole decade that I've been in this industry, continue to preach that you know, the creative is the variable. So yes, I do believe it. I believe if you watch a commercial and you think that product sucks because of it, that's bad. Hey. <laughs> So speaking of great creative, um, I loved the bubbly buble commercial and got such a chuckle out of it. And Stacy here, um, you know, is one of the, the creators behind the commercial from, from PepsiCo. So, um, you know, Stacy, it's interesting because more than half of the pre-submitted Super Bowl ads had celebrities in them, including your bubbly buble commercial, um, yet you used humor. Do you think celebrity is the greatest driver of sentiment, humor? Like, tell us like what was behind your thinking in that, and how how those individual items, celebrity, humor, really make your decisions and where you're going. Sure. Well, first of all, also I think creative is the utmost importance um, in this, and we know when we look at mixed modeling. Just to build on that last point, two thirds of all ROI and sales comes from creative effectiveness more so than even the media. So it's hugely important that, you know, we feel like we have excellent creative at all times. Um, and I think to answer your question about the brand and about Bubbly, um, you know, the first thing is what job are we trying to do with the Super Bowl ad? And so, you know, a Pepsi and a Bubbly are doing two very different things. For Bubbly, that brand has been around less than a year, has relatively low awareness, um, but is really catching on and, and catching fire and people are talking about it. Um, and we said, this is the moment, we're at an inflection point, we want to drastically increase our awareness, but do so in a way that's consistent with the brand. Which, built, which is built on this idea of fun and playful instigation. So when we were looking at creative, we didn't brief in has to have a celebrity. We didn't brief any of that. We briefed what our objectives were, what the brand is about, and then the creative that best got the brand out told people what it was and did so in a way that was worthy of Super Bowl was finding a celebrity whose name happened to be uh, very closely related to the brand name. And so um, it was a little bit of a happy coincidence. I think celebrity always helps in driving PR impressions, talk value, but we would never have done it at the expense of landing the brand message. So as a follow-up question, yeah. Bubbly didn't have a lot of advertising, like you said, or awareness prior to the Super Bowl. Yeah. You went all in big with the Super Bowl. Where do you go from here? We'll have a full year of support this year on Bubbly. So we'll, we're using this as a launch platform. We had a full campaign pre, during, and post around um, around digital and social and a lot of different channels. Uh, in fact, during the Super Bowl, uh, we had teams going out in a bunch of cities and, and putting Sharpies on our products so that consumers could find Bublé instead of Bubbly the next day. Um, and so we had a lot of you know we had a lot of fun with it. Um, and going forward, we're going to continue to have um, you know a full year of of marketing and advertising on this brand. We don't want to have a boom splat where people find out about Bubbly and then forget about it. This is the beginning of a long journey. And what kind of sentiment were you seeing in the social? Uh, extremely problems? positive, extremely positive. It was 15 to one positive to negative. And it yeah. was called out in a lot of places as, as one of the winners from positive sentiment perspective. That's great. Yeah. So um, Anja, according to Twitter, 24 hours after the game, the words boring and Super Bowl <laughs> were tweeted over 70,000 times, and the words worst and Super Bowl were tweeted together over 50,000 times. So do you think that the circumstances of the Super Bowl itself um, affect the effectiveness of the ads in the Super Bowl? Does the research that you're looking at show a difference there? Yeah, 100%. I think it influences the level of attention that people have when the breaks actually come in. Um, I think the level of emotional intensity is also just not there. I think if you're if you're in a mood where you're you know rooting for someone and you know you're very heated and talking with your family about it, and then you see an ad that's great, it just hits home in a different way. Um, and so yeah, I, I do think that the fact that the game 
as someone was telling me on my team that it was the lowest score in history for the Super Bowl. Um, yeah, the fact that it wasn't a very exciting game, I definitely think made the overall um, advertising just not look as exciting. But I also think that the overall advertising just wasn't as bold as it usually is. Um, and so from a creative standpoint, actually one of the things that I was wondering is to what extent has the, the last two years of all these these massive revolutions that deal with diversity, to what extent has it made brands just be fearful about what they can say? Um, and essentially turn, I think it's a good thing that a lot of brands turned to comedy and kept it light because at the end of the day, it is a football game. But, um, but what does that mean from a creative standpoint? How can you cater to everyone? Does that mean that you're basically not catering to anyone in particular? And what sort of campaigns is that good for? So what kind of special considerations then? I mean, and you can all answer this. I mean, at NBC Universal, we had the Super Bowl every three or four years. Um, and we actually built an AI optimizer to help advertisers look at the creative and help them improve it. So there are, th you know, we look at the creative itself. Do you use a celebrity? Do you use dogs or children? Those tend to sell really well. The messaging, how long do you keep your logo on the screen? All those kinds of things. Um, and help marketers drive impact. What kind of considerations do you tell marketers to use? I mean, you can speak, you can, all of you I think should ask, answer this question. You know, it's interesting how you set up the uh, question with dogs and children. Nothing gets more engagement on social than dogs and children, and nothing sells less product for businesses than dogs and children. <laughs> so I tell clients a lot when we first start talking to them when they want to make engagement or other metrics that have nothing to do with their business as the KPI for our existence, I literally look them dead in the face and go, my ability to game that and be the greatest you've ever seen is so scary good, but you probably won't see the business results. How do you know that dogs and children don't sell? Well, because one of the great things about how Vayner looks at things is because we have creative and media under one roof and the only KPI we trade on is selling, whether DTC on Amazon or their own platform or doing massive holdout clusters in Walmarts or things of that nature. What was unique about how our business was built was we weren't one discipline or the other. I didn't know anything about the ad world when I started it, and so because I was building it for myself with the hope of buying businesses and running through it, our religion from nine years ago, still to this day, has always been business results. And so when we look at, in the beginning of my career, when I would look at reports, whether it was traditional reports or things like data logics that came along that helped Facebook justify, when I was looking at internal MMMs and all these things were doing one thing, but then the actual business was doing another, and then the cliche answers of like, because media and creative were split, it was their fault or that fault, it became a very interesting model. As we get, as we've gotten deeper into the process, the beauty of Amazon and direct to consumer or the sophistication that happened as we built a big analytics and media department that allowed us to hold out, you know, regions, stores, locations with consistency over three year sales lifts. And so when we look at testing, Super Bowl ads, we look at, we, we use Link and Milver Brown and some of the same tools that we typically use and we look at all the same metrics and then we add viral potential just for Super Bowl ads. So still brand linkage and engagement and enjoyment are still the most important things, but then we also add this as extra metric to make sure that it has talk value. Um, but we would never sacrifice brand linkage or anything else in favor of that, if that makes sense. And is there any research or stats that you have that marketers should consider when they're making Super Bowl ads? You know, it's interesting. I think uh, one of my friend's companies, Neuro Inside, was um, researching the, I think, 10 of the ads in advance and kind of helping with the creative pre-testing. And as it turns out from both his work and ours, what we see time and time again is that what's right from one brand is not right for another brand. And so, I mean, I, I agree with what you're saying about dogs. And um, although I do remember that the Budweiser puppy thing is, is you know, I have a good feeling about Budweiser. I've, I've never bought it, but... That's an um, issue. Yeah, that is an issue. I also, I don't drink beer. I don't drink beer. That's the fucking punchline of all of this. But if there, was, if there was a puppy next to a bottle of red wine, I might have more favorability <laughs> towards that, I think. But anyways, um, yeah, what works for a brand doesn't work for another brand. And so I think it's not about trying to find... I think our industry is in general obsessed with benchmarks and trying to find these golden nuggets that are going to transform your brand. And 
that's not the case. I think maybe, if anything, from a from uh, both a personal standpoint and what we've seen uh, from a brand awareness perspective is that the constant mention of a name, especially when that name is not known, is really, really important. Um, actually, one of my favorite ads from last year was the Tide ad. I don't know if mm -hmm. you remember it. But yeah. basically, it, it was just the funniest thing. You kept thinking it was this other ad, but then it was a Tide ad, and they kept repeating that to you. And I came out of that, and again, I guess I haven't bought Tide, but you know, at least. That also matters. <laughs> Just think, and I, and I think what really is exciting for me is, and look, uh, I'm, a, I'm a buyer of Super Bowl. Five, like, when NBC gets it again, these were five million, make it 10, because I think they're really underpriced. Yes. And I, please and don't, I mean that. please don't. And I, I mean it, I think, I, I, think, I think they're grossly underpriced for the attention, I really do. When you look at the delta between Super Bowl and then the next 10 most expensive ads, whether it's the AFC, NFC Championship game, the NBA Finals, the Grammys, the Oscars, like, they're expensive and yet nothing like this is gonna happen, right? So I, I think they're very underpriced, but I think the most important thing that happened so far in this talk for me is when you said, I didn't buy it, but maybe if that dog was next to a glass of wine, it'd be more interesting. There's something called Facebook and Google and YouTube and Twitter, which actually has remarkable data to understand that you do have a propensity to like red wine or dogs or things of that nature and we can put those ads in front of you. I'm super fascinated by the unbelievable capabilities of some of the modern platforms to do the thing that you just said that is the most true thing which is it has to resonate, back to your point earlier. What's really tough about television for me I, I'm obsessed with the overall awareness, back to the names and things of that nature. My favorite ad in the last 10 years I've stumbled upon was a Versace ad where the entire ad is just people saying the word Versace. Like I'm, I'm a buyer of certain things like that, but after this and what it does, I'm so obsessed with the fact that we actually now do live in a world where puppy red wine gets in front of you, does exist, and yet there's a disproportionate underestimation of what that actually means. But I think what you're saying also taps into the fact that you know, there's, there's segmentation when it comes to sending the right message to the right person. And then maybe in the context of the Super Bowl, given the fact that you're reaching so many people at the same time, what you're really trying to do is either launch a new product or try to change your brand's perception. But for anything else that's more targeted, for stuff like Tide that everyone already knows about, like is it as effective? Would well, you pay 10 million for that? You know, somebody said to me, Gary, but we have 99% brand awareness already, and I go, and 8% relevance, right? Like, the reality is consideration. To your point, and I think you're making the right point, the word, that, you know, we use the word content so much, and we don't use the word context enough, right? And I think a lot of where you're going is exactly right, and so for me, you know, I, I'm just fascinated that one, and it's funny you brought up the Denny's thing, because. That actually happened like seven or eight years ago. Yeah, it was a while ago and yeah. they haven't done it since and they won't again. Because their product sucks, right? Like they've got, like if you think about what they weren't able to deliver on, they actually got people in. So I've been like watching it for a long time too and I want to hear well, I what, think that's relative if it sucks or not. No, depends no, it on sucks. the audience. I well, think a lot of products that were on the Super Bowl suck. No, no, the product sucked because they were able to get a massive influx of users CAC, but they weren't able to retain it, LTV, right? Yeah, so they basically figured that out and said, we can basically go back for, for scale until we figure this out Correct. internally. Yeah, yeah. Correct, yeah. but what they did worked. Yeah. Like, like to me, what I loved about that ad and have for like the last seven to eight years is it worked. It was more utilitarian, which I loved about it and which I think is a need within the Super Bowl. Their unique issue, to your point, was the product didn't allow them to get the value in their LTV because of the product, right? A lot of things that happen in advertising are funny to me. We win and we lose predicated on the actual thing. There's a lot of people that are part of successes because the product was phenomenal and the advertising was just fine. The product was phenomenal. So there's a lot to unpack there. Um, but I do think context is something that we need to talk more about. And utility to the Super Bowl, I think, is an untapped opportunity. But let, let's talk about, so, you know, can you change people's opinions? I mean, the NFL, they had the, their ad for the 100 years of the NFL. I'm not sure if you saw that one. It had so many players. It was ranked number one by USA Today, which is actually regular people ranking the Super Bowl ads. Um, do you think that they, with all the controversy that they've had, that that ad has now changed the sentiment of how people feel about the NFL? 
I think it helped. Um, and, you know, I think they have a long way to, to climb back from. But what I liked about that ad, besides the fact that I feel like it was a little cheating because they didn't have to pay for <laughs> all the hotel yeah. and the airtime and everything, and it was two minutes long, but it was just fun. It was what people like about football, right? It was fumbles yeah. and interceptions and throwing balls and people falling down and all the talent that we all love. And that's, that's what everyone's craving from the NFL, not all the other baggage that has come with it this year. And so I, I applaud them because I think they got back to what people want to see from them. It, it definitely didn't change anybody's mind who's disproportionately overly passionate about the concussion issues the league has or the flag issues, I, you know, no different than Gillette. Like, one of the things that's so important about ads when, when things are going on in real life is understanding where people sit on issues. Right? So like if you're a mother of a son who's got yeah. five concussions deep in high school and is starting to deal with issues because of the sport of football that you're blaming for that, that ad's doing nothing for you. If you're somebody completely in the middle and kind of like whatever, maybe it did move you a little bit. And so I think that's, what, that's an important variable in those kind of things. I think it's so hard to change perception with one thing, especially one thing that airs during your biggest event. I think you, you have to try harder. It's just, and, and do it at scale and use volume as well as context throughout the entire year to get that done. The other thing is, I think we talk a lot about things and everybody here is a keyboard warrior and a real champion out there publicly on social media, but then our actions are different, right? So like there's a lot of people that say a lot of things then act differently. Like NFL ratings did quite nicely this year because the games played out differently on prime time. Like so, I, I think there's a lot of, there's the level of hypocrisy in our society is staggering. And people are tough guys and gals on Twitter about products and services, and then they spend their money in a different way. So speaking of products and services, Verizon, they took a route of, of acknowledging first responders and then tying it back to the NFL. Do you think that that made a, a strong impact for brand, or, it, or did it get, were people confused, like how does this have to do with my wireless service. Stacy, go ahead. Elliot, do you go first? Yeah, I mean, I, I think some of those, I think Verizon and T-Mobile and Auto, I think a lot of those industries are really hard to land the what brand it's for. Um, I thought Verizon did a, pretty, uh, did a really good job, and I thought, um, you know, linking it to the NFL players and being contextually relevant made a lot of sense. I'm not sure anyone, like, you know, in, in a few months, people are going to remember that it was Verizon. I think they'll remember the ad because it was a really beautiful, powerful ad. But I think it's, re I, to, I mean, to Gary's point, like, unless you have cell phones all over these ads, I'm not, I'm not sure it's landing a product message. If you remember it's Verizon, you might think more positively about it, but first you have to remember it's Verizon. I don't know. So we work with um, almost all the big telcos. Um, I think Verizon's the only one we don't work with yet. Um, so I can't speak to the data itself, but what I will say is that by and large, almost all the other big telcos aren't making necessarily this type of advertising. They're a lot more focused on the innovation utility piece and the educational piece. Um, for what it's worth as a consumer, I'm actually, uh, I've been exposed to a bunch of their, their um, videos in the series. And I've actually remembered that Verizon is the company that helps first responders pick up the call. Um, and for what it's worth, it's made my perception more positive. I think there's a long way to go now in terms of educating me why it's a better option. But from a uh, perception standpoint, it's worked for me and I love the ad. And the thing I love the most about it is that it actually created a thread for me yeah. over time as opposed to just this one thing. I think if it had been just one thing, I, I agree with you, I probably would have forgotten about it. I didn't love it, you know. Didn't hit your heartstrings? Nope. Why didn't you love it? I didn't remember it. Like, I watched it again. It came at the end. Like, I just thought it was poorly executed. Like, I hate things that happen at the end, like the URLs that people are trying to send it to you. Like, ESPN established this 15 years ago. Put it at the bottom the whole time. Like, you're asking people, you know, I don't know, I just didn't love it. And I also think, look, I I'm always thinking about things like this of like, what normal human being is like going through the process that we are right now, none. And so I'm trying to understand like, do we become caricatures of ourselves because we're in the bubble and are analyzing it at a level that is just not real? Or is this us synthesizing what people are actually naturally going through? But for me, I didn't love it because I didn't remember it. 
I didn't remember it when it showed here, um, and even the way it was executed. I don't love the unveil at the end kind of thing, um, and didn't pull up my heartstrings. Not that I'm thrilled somebody's gotta be the phone service for first responders. It didn't, I don't know, not for me. Yeah, I think you hit on a really important point, which is simplicity. So I think when you have a lot of exposure to a campaign and you study it and you watch it a few times, it's different. The vast majority of the 100 million people that are gonna see this have two seconds, they look at it, they might chuckle, you know, they might feel something in their heart and then they're on to the next yeah. thing. And so keeping it simple, I think, can be really important. Yeah, and the, and the vast majority is actually 99.99%, right, right? Exactly, right? But speaking of pulling at the heartstrings, it wasn't one of the ads we showed, but the Microsoft um, really pulled at the heartstrings. Yet I'm not so sure that I was left knowing like what the product was. Like I knew it had something to do with video games. Um, anyone want to comment on that? I just think high consideration products are never going to do that well at the Super Bowl. Um, I think low consideration products that need to get differentiated, that need to get launched, that need brand awareness are going to be good. But any high consideration product that has a longer sales cycle, very tough. So can I ask you a question on that? Yeah. So uh, those kind of items on regular TBC outside of Super Bowl? No, I think, again, if you're trying to talk about the awareness or, or get the awareness, it might work. I think from a educational standpoint, it doesn't. 30 seconds doesn't help with that. I think you need a lot of content and I think you need to target it at the right people at the right time. Yeah, and that's why the awareness, like that's, that's the thing I'm trying to work through, which I appreciate. I think that's exactly right, like awareness. And then I'm trying to understand the delta of literally every other commercial but the Super Bowls, ability to actually get awareness and actually be consumed, not potential GRPs. And so that's like an interesting concept of awareness in a medium that, I mean, it's scary for me to think with this audience let, or anybody in America, their behavior switches to Amazon Prime, Hulu, and Netflix as just where you consume, period. And then what's left over the last five years of commercials, what's actually being consumed versus looking at your phone, it starts getting to scary territory for me for the ability to build awareness. I but do, look at GoDaddy. I, like, I just have to say, like, GoDaddy, who knew about them before the Super Bowl? Was there any GoDaddy in this year's Super Bowl? Like, well, the no, right? expensive I tried, and I was pumped that two fucking chains was in the building, but I'm not sure if they pulled it off. I would just go back to Microsoft for a second, though, because I don't know. I wonder if you're making that ad, if your objective is to really get people to understand what that product does, or if it was a brand perception equity kind of driving thing that is then supported by other media that sells the actual product. You know, so it, it, you know, it made a lot of people feel something and you know, Microsoft doesn't often make people feel something the way Apple does. So I think that my guess is it was more about trying to change their equity and change their perception a little bit, not so much about trying to explain the product. I don't know if this is just me, but I, I think if you're trying to, to do that and trying to kind of aim at your you know, millennial hipster. I don't know if the Super Bowl is the best, the best time to do that. I almost feel like if you are at the Super Bowl, you're not going to be perceived as a super cool brand that young people are going to embrace. So if you're trying to sell a product towards that audience, I think it's tough. Um, and again, like Microsoft has great brand awareness. I think when it comes to educating people and getting them to perceive you as a cool brand, changing that perception, I think you can turn to other places for less money and more target. Uh, that's just me. I wasn't sure if I was getting the five minute sign from the back. She's not paying attention. Okay. Lara, do we Lara, have more you, than five minutes? Are you giving the five minute sign? I saw you like hold up like that. Okay, all right. <laughs> Just waving. Uh, exactly. Be Q, there's Q&A. Right. Q&A um, will be coming soon. So in your opinion, if a brand is gonna choose you know, one thing to shell out, is it celebrity? Um, licensing an iconic piece of music like Funky Town, um, CGI, um, 
God, what else is there they could spend a lot of money on? <laughs> Two minutes long commercial. What would what would you choose, Stacy? What would what would be the thing that you it, would invest? It depends. <laughs> <laughs> no, it does. I mean, again, I think it. You know, based on the development, the creative development process, and what your objectives are, and what your brand stands for, a brand like Bubbly is always going to lean on humor, and will more likely use a piece of music or a celebrity, or might use animation. But um, it depends on the creative idea. I think you do need something for Super Bowl, um, but I think that something needs to be an excellent creative idea, and then the bells and whistles that are around it should add to that, shouldn't cover up something that's just not good to begin with. So I, I mean, I wouldn't, I don't know, I, next year it could be something different than I would choose this year. And Anna? Yeah, I mean, look, if there's a formula for success, I think marketers would be billionaires and we would be out of business as a data company. Um, I think you know there's there's different things that have worked for different brands at a high level. The, the the things that I've been saying throughout the panel is I would use it for brand awareness and I would try to mention the name a million times to make sure that people do stick with something even if it's a 30 second slot. Um, and you know, it takes someone like Bumble. I think if I were a, an innovative company, I I wouldn't necessarily turn to the Super Bowl for this. Uh, I I think there's uh, potentially a negative brand equity that you get amongst young people if you turn to the Super Bowl for, um, for awareness. So that's just me. Two minutes. <laughs> you would spend the money on the two minutes? In the way you asked the question, yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I just think it's grossly underpriced attention and then to everything you're hearing up here, the variable is the creative and, and the moment in time and the context. I think, I think that the price is very, very underpriced, mainly because of the reality of businesses. I'm stunned by how much the biggest brands in the world are willing to spend on television outside of the Super Bowl, and I'd prefer them just buy Super Bowl at scale and then take their dollars elsewhere in some of the contextual other channels that we've referenced. So I think it's important to like not take it out of a silo of like what's actually happening out there. And so what's actually happening out there is there's brands sitting there and saying, ooh, Super Bowl's expensive, let me just spend 3.7 or 5.7 through the year on television, and I'm just, deeply in belief that they are just getting absolutely no consumption of that. And, and, and they're getting no consumption in many digital places too, programmatic banners and many other, there's, an, there's a stunning amount of money being thrown directly in the trash and I think Super Bowl is not one of those places. Um, and I think current certain capabilities of social platforms are not one of those places. And then finding the creative that's contextual for those platforms is very, very important during this time of the haves and have nots, which is why we're seeing so many brands decline because when you're wasting 95 cents on the dollar, uh, you're gonna get in trouble. Quick question, do, well, you, do I, you actually believe that every brand could benefit from the Super Bowl? Like let's say Salesforce or Notch could benefit from the Super Bowl? It's an interesting question. I, I agree with where your macro statement is, that there's time and place, like, but I will say this. I do believe that every brand can benefit from, so the macro, the answer to your question directly the way you asked it, no, I don't think every brand, brand can. However, that gets in contradiction with my belief that it is so grossly underpriced that if they were to understand what to do with that time, you know, I think what we're trying to do is too much entertainment and branding. Back to utility, I think that Salesforce, if they ran their ad and said, go to salesforce.com right now and fill this out, if you're in B2B at all, or we're introducing this thing, I do think the awareness, which we, I think we all understand has value, is actually there. Like to me, it's like, it's crazy that it's actually there. Six, I, I don't know if I mentioned this last year, like five, uh, five or six years ago, I tried to buy a Super Bowl ad. It was, I tried to buy a Super Bowl ad because I knew nothing about buying television and I, it, it was very expensive for a human. It was basically about as much income as I could have spent at that point in my life and I was gonna run an ad and it was gonna be a picture of my face. Like I was gonna make, all, I was gonna film it on my phone. I was gonna be like, hey America, it's me, it's Gary. Follow me on Twitter, Gary V-E-E -E, and be out. And I, and I remember like going through the logic of that as a human and saying like this is gonna be the best thing I ever do because it's going to work. I'm gonna amortize out this attention and value over the rest of my life. I think that the attention is so underpriced in comparison to every other option in marketing that every business should challenge itself deeply to try to figure, how about just using it as a first party data collector? Like, I, and I'm passionate about that. How, oh, Go ahead. Why, why? 
love your passion for the Super Bowl, I would have to argue so much about television not being impactful because we have so much research that actually proves the opposite, including ROI metrics that show how we can drive Don't believe any KPI. And not a buyer. Well, thank God. <laughs> um, but we can have that conversation another time. Or here. Um, <laughs> I think when people spend other people's money, they spend it differently. And so I think that, you know, I have empathy, uh, but I'm always curious what a lot of media buyers and executives would do if their actual children's health depended on that media spend versus what they do for a living. Yeah, I think, I think marketers are trying to find ways to be more engaging with consumers using the medium in a more powerful and impactful way, content in context putting yourself around brand, you know, brands that really marry your brand to a content brand. Stacey, what yeah, is yeah we, we've done, so on Bubbly, the, the outside of the Super Bowl, the two big investments we've had are on the television side, the integration, media integration. So we have a big partnership with The Ellen Show, and we've had an eight-week flight, and it's in show. All of Love. the content is in show. Love. And so, to Gary's, yeah, because to your Love. point, right, people are watching that, and then it Love. goes out on October. <laughs> Love it, that's where television started. Ed Sullivan was brought to you by Lincoln Town Company. Uh, People watch things, the format of a commercial. By the way, one of my favorite things that's happened in marketing in the last five years, back to your point, countering my point, is the way that television now with sports is splitting the screen. That's been a Mm -hmm. huge coup. Like, I I believe that's a good move. And so I think- Picture in picture is is a huge thing. Now it's even in entertainment, and we're able to do actually interactive picture in picture. And consumers are telling us, they like that. We're seeing it like in red carpet. They want to see the behind the yep. scenes of what's going on. And you're right. I mean, we all have to get better at improving the commercial experience. And things like you're doing with Ellen and integration opportunities are huge and important. And then there's things like the Super Bowl or the Academy Awards or the Grammys that are going to drive huge awareness and are around passion points that consumers love. And and you know whether it's like fashion of the red carpet around the Academy Awards, or music in the Grammys, or the whole pomp and circumstance around America and the Super Bowl. I think we should talk about things like Instagram and Twitter's usage during sports and the Grammys explodes during commercial time as, cl- as a real data point. Yes. Like, we, like to your point, like listen, people have businesses and are driving their thing and I have empathy for that, but this industry is really silly when it talks about consumer centric because it's not. It's business centric to the KPIs of their businesses. And I think a lot of that creates vulnerabilities that don't need to be there. And I think, if anything, things like you know, Blockbuster going out of business and Netflix and, and Sears and Toys R Us, there's so many indicators that when you start doing things that are in your best interest in the short term financially, at, that are against what's in the best interest of the consumer, that eventually becomes a losing formula. And I do think a lot of innovation on the TV side would be a great idea sooner than later. Yeah, no, we're, we're definitely seeing that. I mean, we're testing new things at Miss Universal. You have to do that to engage consumers. So, um, anyone want to say one final point before I toss it to the audience for a Q&A? Super Bowl ads. One final point, Gary. Buy them. <laughs> <laughs> and spend $10 million on 30 seconds. I believe that. On a, Make sure that it's the right choice for your brand. <laughs> yeah, that was going to be mine. And creative matters. Creative quality matters. Okay. <laughs> and five hundred. <laughs> <bye-bye. laughs> <laughs> yes. Question. Yeah, we'll repeat well, it. Well, I, you I, have the mic. So. I'm loud enough. Is it? We so, can throw the mic at you too. <laughs> I guess. I guess the most important thing that you're saying is that you have to know what you're doing the ad for, what your goals are, because. Uh, it, are, is the only goal to sell product, or is there a longer term goal, which, uh, as you were pointing out, Gary, that there's an interplay between, for better or for worse, with social media that is gonna have to resonate because people are on their cell phones as much as they're on anything else? Well, I think, look, these are businesses up here, and there's nothing wrong with running a business and trying to sell product. I think the best way to sell a product is to actually build a brand and not be sales-centric. You'd like to, you know, and so what I think Super Bowl does is gives you that potential to do the holy grand. The best salespeople are the ones that built a brand and then let people come to them in perpetuity. So, and I do think the Super Bowl offers that. So, yes, I think that's the goal, but like obviously, 
you know, short and long-term goals matter and this is what's so amazing about branding and marketing over DR selling and intent-based Google ads. It's you can actually build something that gives you longevity. And if in regard to the social media and the interplay between that ad and the social media, anybody else have a comment or any thought on that? I mean, look, I, I actually am, when I was saying that you should accompany that with other digital assets, like, look, social media is great. I think it creates a lot of noise. Um, I don't love social media from a data collection standpoint. No one does. There's not a lot of room to truly understand your audience um, or to be able to harness that data in a strategic way for your brand. So I think uh, it's great to think about the higher level stuff and then with the kind of brand awareness campaign. But I think fundamentally, you need to figure out a way to drive people back to your own denominated properties. You have to figure out how to have a direct conversation with your audience, and that's really the only way you can start driving towards sales, at least in our world, in the B2B world. Hi, my name is Lee Nadler. Thanks for this discussion. Let's assume, yes, Super Bowl, okay? One of the things that uh, I thought was really interesting, and I know it's a word that's thrown around, is authenticity. <laughs> Forget the celebrity for a second. Let's talk about like actually entertainment versus product explanation. I thought Bud Light did some interesting things. One was up there, but the other ones that were up there with the corn syrup and so forth. I'm trying to do it in an entertaining way, but actually making a point about the product. But uh, two years ago, I orchestrated a campaign for Mini Cooper called Defy Labels. And it was a, basically a program that had celebrities, was entertaining. But we looked in the mirror and said, what is it that people are saying about our product and how do we defy that with celebrities who actually also defy that label and had a mini? My question really is, and I don't think we touched on it, when you look at something like Gillette, okay, the criticism that I heard, and I could be debated either way, and I'd love to hear it from you guys on authenticity, what was the problem that they had by either having the conversation or did they not have an authentic thing beyond just putting the conversation out there? And I think it's really interesting to look at when you're gonna make a big statement. It's easy to say we don't have corn syrup and all that, but if Gillette is gonna say, you know, we're the best, a man can be and we're going to do this and support women's issues and all that and then they don't actually support the women's issues that becomes a problem and i just want to ask i guess the group about brands making statements that are in the social uh discussion Sphere. and how authentic do you have to be to get into that kind of discussion so I would say Procter & Grant Campbell is actually putting their money where their mouth is and are leading the charge with changing the way that women are portrayed in media and advertising um, with hashtag see her much. See her, yes. see her. Yep. So, so I, I think it could have, right, been, I, I, right, that could have been a miss because people don't know that if you're not in our, in our business. And how do you then attach so that consumers know that you are doing good and, and you know, it, it, it is tough, I think, to link together what you're doing versus making a big, bold statement that they made. And, and I could see that there, there could be a disconnect for some people um, when they watch that ad. More, more pointed, whether Gillette or the others, just people are going, and they're going deeper. They're going onto social, they're, they're doing research on the brand, and what's the barometer for, we're gonna make this statement, and here's our backup for it's real, versus, we're gonna talk in a social conversation and just have the discussion, but there's nothing deeper. I think you know the answer. Nobody likes somebody who's all talk and no action. That's just something we don't appreciate. Hypocrisy's not cool, and so I think, yes, it's a really bad idea to try to look the part and not back it up because people are looking for that vulnerability. Our, our judgment levels on each other and businesses today are enormously high, and. So yeah, I mean that's, that's always been a bad idea. That's no different than your product not being great, right? right? Like, so that's a different version of your product not being great. Yeah, it's a, if you're gonna make the statement, you've gotta back it up and you know, we, we, America, America is an interesting place. Like, we don't often mind the crime. We mind when the person's trying to cover it up, right? Like we don't like to be fooled. And so yeah, if a company comes out and is trying to make a big to do, but then their actions don't speak to that. But that's happening every day. I mean, you look on the coasts, 
the amount of people that talk about the environment but aren't willing to talk about that their Prada bags or their clothes and textiles are driving some of the biggest damage in our society. Like we are one to two issue people. And so like. That's kind yeah, of what I'm asking, how deep do you have to go? I think it's really tricky because even if you do back it up with authenticity and that, you know, that is not easy and then you are about that. Right? And so even if you do it all right, is it the right thing to be about that issue? You have to decide that as a for-profit business. Um, and I do think having a purpose in the world is something that every brand needs to have, but tying that purpose to a very hot social issue, I think each brand needs to decide if that's worth the risk. And, By and the way, did everybody see the Miller New York Times ad today in response to the Bud Light? That was awesome. Mm, that was yeah, yeah, look at that. Is it ever a good idea to put another company, you know, put somebody down during that? Third? I, mean, I think Miller yeah. responded great yeah, to that. Sure. I think the <laughs> amount of people that saw Miller's response versus Bud's move is an enormous delta, and I think that's an important thing for me. You know? But they could have done that ad without actually calling. I don't know. But I, I loved it. I love, I I'll, I'll be on the record saying I love it. I think ads, I think businesses need to do a little bit more of that. I think it, it's a very poignant point. It, it caught your attention that they were willing to even go there. Yeah. And I think back to like us being hypocrites, we don't like attack ads in politicians, yet it's very clear that it works. And so, you know, I think, I think in, what I appreciated was that it was an attack in a very, very, you know, kind of softer way. I thought it was clever and like, I think there's more upside. I don't know how big the issue is for the end consumer. I'm just not educated enough on that. But it definitely got the point across. And back to why I believe in the Super Bowl, man, do I think very few people saw the print ad in the Times today at scale in comparison. Yeah, I think that's true. It's funny, the point, um, you know, there was a lot of discussion positive and negative, more positive, but some negative about, you know, the Pepsi commercial had the word coconut. And like, oh my God. I but love no, that you did it. Pepsi is challenger brands. I don't that's know if you. Pepsi does, and that is a truth. That 100%. When you go and you order a, a Coke at a restaurant, they say, is Pepsi okay? Like, that is something that is true in the world. And we built off of that that said something about our brand. But, you know, not everybody is comfortable with that. And, the, and, um, and that's, and I think that's where we get to B2B. Like, I don't know if like the head honchos at Pepsi heard, but most of us know Coke and Pepsi have some similarities. <laughs> like, like, we're just so not consumer centric, you know? Like. You have a question? Yeah. I'm glad you what did that. What about the Super Bowl surround uh, halo effect strategy or campaign? So recently, when I was watching all of these ads on Monday, a GMC ad popped up on the whatever website I was on watching these articles. And the title card came in saying the Rams already lost, went into selling GMC ads. So super fast, super relevant. They were prepared for it. Had maybe two weeks notice as to who was going to do it. I don't feel I'm ever pitched as a client. What should my surround sound of an event that could affect me be? And so is that a more cost effective way to leverage the Super Bowl if I can't do a five to ten million dollar thirty second? I mean, if you can't do the spot, you gotta do what you can do about it, right? I think one of the reasons a lot of times there aren't good holistic, you know, I used to always wonder when I first got in, like why aren't people a little more 360 with their campaigns? And that was because I didn't understand the dynamics of the creative agency landscape. I didn't know that creative agencies thought everything besides TVC was bullshit and garbage and not of respect and didn't mean anything and, and afterthoughts and so, you know, once I learned that, then I understood. I'm like, oh, okay, they just completely disrespect it, put no energy to it. Plus then media is the separate thing to begin with, you know, and, and the KPIs and, you know, we're not gonna buy that inventory because it doesn't achieve the low cost CPM that we have to hit to get bonus. And so like real life takes over, but it, that's a good idea. <laughs> you know, and that's the punchline. The, like, the, the, the right Sorry. things aren't being done because of the vested interest of partners within the reality of this business world. So is, sorry, as a follow up, is the solution then to, for brands like JPMC to in-house more of their work? That sounds like a great idea. I am disproportionately, I'm in disproportionate belief that every brand in the world should do all their marketing in-house if they're capable to. <laughs> Being dead fucking serious. The problem is, the problem is that I'm really hoping I'd catch you with that one and just failed. I, I will never ever put my financial vested interest 
in front of being historically correct, right? Because that's where I think people struggle and make big mistakes. Like the reality is if you're capable, the problem for brands when you play it out is when the economy gets soft and Wall Street doesn't like all that overhead, it helps to have. So like there's all these real things, but yes, I think anything you can do better for a better price with better intent is a good idea. Question in the back. Yeah. Two more questions. Okay. Hi. Um, quick question. With digital marketing, right, we see a lot of... Can you hold your mic close? Sorry. Yeah. Can you hear me? I'm like showing you. With digital marketing, we see a lot of personalized, hyper-targeted assets, right, hitting consumers. So my question is, what's going to happen to this, you know, the advertising in general for the Super Bowl? when a streaming service such as Netflix or Amazon gets the rights hands on the rights, right? Because yes, we have CBS, we have NBC Universal uh, bidding, you know, getting the Super Bowl and they're investing into streaming services. But what happens when a non-traditional streaming service such as Netflix, Amazon, gets their hands on the Super Bowl in terms of how will that affect metrics? How will that affect media buys? How will that affect content in general? Are we going to see personalized content, or are we going to see these like wide net advertising campaigns? So you know, Gary said it before in terms of we have to look where the consumer is going, and we all need to work together as an industry to really change the ecosystem of how advertising works in the places that it's available. And you also said, you know, you go back to the day-to-day -day realities of like, I need to make my OCM, mm -hmm. and my hit my P and Ls, mm -hmm. and the reality set in. But the consumers aren't going to stop moving the way that they're moving. And so, you know, look, there were pictures of uh, Bezos, you know, with the head of the NFL, um, and that's something that could be scary. But can they really continue to be non-profitable? Um, and, and, and make money just on subscriptions because a one-way revenue stream has proven that it will fail and that you need dual revenue stream with the, with the price of content. And you see someone like Facebook who's unwilling to get into the content game because their margins would go through the floor. So it's really us working together, I think, as an industry to give consumers advertising because three out of four people who watch Super Bowl said that they were looking forward to seeing the commercials. Yeah. It is part of the pop culture conversation and they want great creative. And they also want to be informed about new brands. So it, I really think it's working together to, to my, make it better. My take on that is it, three out of four sounds right and low intuitively, but what about every other commercial that exists in the world? What's the polling on that? And when Amazon gets the NFL rights, it's gonna come down to how they want to monetize it, right? To your point, how long will Wall Street allow them to invest and when does the bloom come off the rose? And that becomes the question. But once you have that much first party data and behavior, nobody here, I, I, I ask everybody here to ask themselves how much they're willing to pay for Amazon Prime versus what they're paying now. Well Hulu, when they offered the 99 cents for ad load, most of the subscribers took the ad load. So, I mean, they, they couldn't but, but really... Because Hulu's right one-dimensional, right? Sorry? Am Hulu's one-dimensional. One more time, how much is everybody willing to pay for Amazon Prime, which delivers all Amazon your products? I Amazon Prime is not as good as Hulu, and I think consumers in general... Find I'm talking about actual Amazon Prime, the shit that oh, everybody right. here has to buy everything they buy. So never they charge, is the answer. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's, that, like, what we're having is we're having siloed conversations. And when Amazon has last mile and you can order toothpaste and get it in, in 24 seconds in your door, I think we're having a naive conversation. And when the entire, guys, if the terrorists attacked Amazon's infrastructure for the internet, the whole internet would collapse. Everybody is on the infrastructure. So like, there is a lot of leverage points that, that Amazon has that we, are, that we have to factor into this because they have leverage. Everybody here would pay a lot more for Prime because the value of free delivery across all the products and service they buy is enormous. And that is just, that's just real life. And it'll be interesting to see, and I don't know, how much more are we willing to pay for that core service that is so important? They lay, layer on top of it. And so, I mean, they have a lot of 
They have a lot of leverage. I, I think to your question, it just means that we're all in this room going to have to get a lot smarter and better. And it doesn't mean that we're going to stop advertising and brand building, but we're going to have to do it in a different way. And if Super Bowl is no longer the advertising cultural event, we'll find another way to do it. And we did it. Like Super Bowl One wasn't even sold out. Like the ads on Joe Lewis's fight on the radio were a fortune in the 40, like this is not that long ago. Like we're always going to move to where the attention is. The question becomes the ad formats. The reason I love the Ellen integration is that's good. You're consuming that. Like I think brands should be spending way more integrating into the actual content and how networks decide to do that and things of that nature. I mean Amazon might come out and not have commercials or who knows, but like what, what Amazon has is something that nobody else has. When they have the NFL rights and you're watching your game and a player scores a touchdown and you're excited and the friction of you being able to know that because something just happened during their game that if you just say, Alexa, order me a Sam Darnold jersey, it's discounted because they're playing, they're eliminating friction. They're gonna make <laughs> revenue in a way other people haven't. Well, we're, we, not, we're not, we're not. Yeah, but like, but like, do you know what I mean? Like they're eliminating, like you're watching a football game. Something good happens, you're a diehard fan and you're aware now through marketing and branding that you can just buy that product through voice. Like the, what we do all the time is we make binary decisions without understanding the other variables that this infrastructure is creating. That's gonna make them highly profitable. Their, their, their content's valuable to them, they sell shit. NBC and ESPN don't. I think it's really important to also remember that a few years ago we were talking about Facebook exactly the same way. I think there's going to be a lot of ethical issues that come into play that I think we should consider. This idea that Amazon's taking over the world and they're going to use their servers to, and the Alexa's to kind of fully integrate leave, uh, and in a really creepy way completely change our lives, I think potentially might have some checks and balances in place. Sure. The government um, gets involved when somebody wins too much. Yeah, but I think it's even more than that. I do wonder what the evolution of Facebook is going to be in a world where the consumer is becoming a lot more vigilant about what's happening with their data. Well, if you look at Instagram's behavior, we, you know, the, the answer is we go where we value things, right? It's and a very different thing, Instagram versus Facebook. And the brand awareness around the issues of Facebook, for some reason, don't relate to Instagram for now. <laughs> I think they might. Because hypocrisy is cute. <laughs> we have one, one last question in the back, right? Oh. Uh, so I guess two questions. Just if you were to see a red wine puppy ad, would you have had a better Super Bowl ad experience? And how would you have felt about whatever that brand was that showed that to you? Because I feel like that's available in digital technology, but it, you know, I'm wondering when it sort of comes to TV because I, I think we're ready for it. I, well, I'm just going to really quickly say something. I think there, there's an element of me seeing that and feeling like I discovered it and there's something really special there about it versus feeling like someone's read my mind and has put that into my plate in a way that feels really creepy and intrusive. I am one of the two, two to five percent of people who actually care about how their data is being used because I just know too much about it, but I would say half the people don't care. I think that might change with time and regardless it doesn't matter because if five percent of the people care enough, they're going to change the way everything else works. But also consumers are moving the way that they view traditional linear television content in a digital format, whether it's a Roku or you name your your app. And so there, those products are data enabled and you're gonna see a huge shift of being able to do addressable linear television um, like you've never been able to do before. The technology is now catching up with consumer behavior. So I think it's really exciting times for all of us, but again, we have to protect the consumer and give them their privacy and um, be responsible with what we do. And I would like to add that Jeff Bezos did say that television advertising was one of the most powerful vehicles and he wasn't a fan and changed his mind in the last year because he started to invest heavily and see how it was driving sales and usage of, of Amazon Prime, so. I think using fear as a sales tactic is interesting. And I think that is like an important, like uh, seriously, I think it's a really important, like I think it's interesting. Like first of all, everybody just has opinions, right? And then things play out. And I, I, have, I value massively people that have different points of view on things, massively. I just, I think that there's ideologies around human beings that historically humans haven't delivered on. And so that's what I'm trading on, but this may be the singular issue and that's fine and you know, 
I, I, I think that's great. Well, I think that wraps up our show. Thank you, Notch, for having us tonight. Hey guys, thank you so much for watching my video on YouTube. I wanted to jump in here at the end because I'm working on a ridiculously important project for me and I have a funny feeling you can help. If you drink wine at all or know anybody that drinks wine at all, please go to empathywines.com right now and sign up for a subscription. Whether it's a three pack, whether it's a six pack, or whether it's a whole case of each for the year, if you drink 36 bottles of wine a year or give away 36 bottles of wine a year, please sign up for Club Empathy. This project means the world to me I could really use your support.